Welcome to Global Ethics Review. I'm Alex Woodson from Carney Council, the world's catalyst for ethical action. In this podcast series, we'll be connecting Carney Council's work and current events with our senior fellows, senior staff, and friends of our organization. You'll hear from leading experts on artificial intelligence and technology, migration, public health, and U.S. foreign policy and global engagement. In this episode, we'll be looking back at the summer of 2020 and the massive racial justice protests that started in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd and quickly spread across the world. In the months after these protests, Carnegie Council hosted an event series called Protests in Perspective, co-sponsored by the Open Society University Network. These events looked at the protests from an international and historical perspective and featured some of the leading voices on racial justice, human rights, and the history of protest movements. For transcripts, podcasts, and videos from these talks, you can go to carnegiecouncil.org. In this episode of Global Ethics Review, I reconnected with one of those featured speakers, Adam Gattaccio, Neubauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science in the college at the University of Chicago. She's a political theorist with research interests in the history of political thought, theories of race and empire, and post-colonial political theory. Her work is focused on the intellectual and political histories of Africa and the Caribbean. She's the author of World Making After Empire, the rise and fall of self-determination. In this podcast, you'll hear some clips from Professor Gattaccio's October 2020 event entitled On the Streets for Social Justice, Lessons from the Past. And you'll also hear our discussion about whether progress has been made, what these issues look like a year after the protests, and how we can move the discussions and actions forward. This first clip is from Professor Gattaccio's opening statement in the 2020 event. She discussed the unique place that the United States occupies in the world and why the protests went global. After the clip, you'll hear the beginning of our talk. Now I want to turn to why it is that African-American struggle in particular galvanizes so much attention. And I want to make the case to you that it's exemplary. And what I mean by exemplary is that the struggle of African-Americans for racial equality and full citizenship in the United States represents a universal struggle and experience. Um, There are racial and ethnic and religious minorities around the world uh, who face similar kinds of battles for equity and inclusion within their various societies. But I think three things make the African-American struggle, you know, stand out as something to uh, gravitate towards, something that you can, you always look to, you know, one, it's a 400 year struggle. Right, we just celebrated last year the 400 years of the first arrival of Africans in, onto the shores of the United States or what would become the United States. Um, second, it's a struggle that happens in a country that claims to be the birthplace of modern democracy, right? This is the country that tells us all the time that it is the exemplary and exceptional democracy in the world that all others should emulate. emulate. So the the contradiction or the crisis around this epic struggle for full citizenship in the country that tells everyone in the world that it is the model democracy, I think draws people to this experience. Um, And finally, in the 20th and 21st centuries, of course, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. Everything that happens in America gets a great deal of attention, right? I'm sure many of you around the world even had to Uh, bear witness to the travesty that was our presidential debate just earlier this week. Um, So there's a way in which all eyes are on America because it's such a powerful country in the world. Um, And I think in that context, for many people around the world, they identify with and feel solidarity with the the internal David, um, you know, in the against that's that's fighting against the Goliath of American power. Um, So there's this very important exemplarity uh, of African-American action for the rest of the world. But I just want to say one last thing, and then um, we can begin our conversation, which is that, you know, solidarity uh, mobilizations aren't just about what's happening in the U.S. Um, They're not, but they're about moments in which uh, protesters around the world actually connect their local struggles to the exemplary case of the United States. So when protesters mobilize in Europe or in other parts of the world, in Brazil, they're not just demanding justice for George Floyd or justice for Breonna Taylor. They're using those kind of you know, horrific, exceptional, exemplary cases to highlight contradictions and struggles that they face at home. 
Professor Edom Gatacho, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me, Alex. Relating to uh, to that statement, to your opening statement from last year, um, you were talking about how the United States sets the tone in some way for the rest of the world as a big, powerful nation. People look up to the United States uh, around the world in, in terms of many different aspects. Um, so what are you seeing right now? What, what is the world taking from the United States right now uh, in relation to racial, racial justice? Um, it's not the big story that it was last year on the news. The mass protests aren't happening in the same way. I know there's still a lot of work that needs to be done though. So is this movement over as far as getting worldwide attention? And what, what are you seeing from the rest of the world as, as far as this, this story? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, you're right that uh, we're not in the kind of summer uprisings. We're not speaking in the wake of the summer uprisings from last year, but we have continued to see ongoing mass protests. And I think most recently earlier in the year in connection with uh, Palestine and um, solidarity between primarily Black Lives Matter movement for Black Lives Matter folks and, and, and Palestinian activists and organizers. Um, so I think there has continued to be presence on the streets, uh, but I think we can also look to elsewhere um, to see the kind of ways in which this movement uh, has, has shaped uh, American politics. So uh, after we spoke, there was a really important election in the United States. Um, I think activists and organizers uh, were very mobilized in terms of uh, getting people to, to register to vote and certain places where there had been really um, important mobilizations in the summer saw increases in regist voter registration. Um, and that has contributed to electing some really important progressive voices who are aligned with some of the uh, goals of the movement for black lives. Um, so Corey Bush uh, from uh, um, um, the St. Louis area, Congresswoman from the St. Louis area would be one kind of prominent example. I think flipping the Senate and in Georgia was another instance in which organizers and activists from a wide array of backgrounds from union organizers to um, Movement for Black Lives activists got together to make that possible. Um, I think additionally, you've seen kind of um, ongoing efforts at the local and state level, say to uh, reduce funding of police departments, to try and um, redirect resources to other kinds of uh, areas and initiatives. Um, so these efforts persist, uh, they're dispersed, you know, they're not, um, they're decentralized, so they're much harder to, I think, pinpoint and track in the same way as, um, as you know, as the kind of uprisings were last summer. Uh, I think I, the other thing I would say is that I think this may not be, these aren't of course um, coordinated in any way, but you do see a wider global kind of uh, movements that are really have taken state violence as their primary targets of, uh, of critique and opposition. Um, so in the fall, there was the end SARS movement in Nigeria, which really echoed in very in similar ways the kind of organizing and tactics of the movement for Black Lives in the United States. I've already mentioned uh, the Palestinian uprisings of earlier this year. Uh, earlier this year, so I do see this kind of convergence around a critique of of state violence and racialized state violence occurring in, in a variety of settings. So you, you mentioned a lot of work that's being done in, in Washington and local politics. Um, do you think that's enough? Is there is there a problem that the media isn't paying as much attention to this, that we don't have the, these protests from last summer? Is this the way that protest movements naturally go? I mean, would, would you like to see more done or, or is this progress uh, that you're happy with right now? Yeah, I mean, I definitely like to see more done. Um, I think, you know, uh, we live in a, in a, there's a lot of kind of challenges, institutional challenges to, to translating, you know, protest movements into sort of institutional legislative programs. Um, uh, so I think just to name one kind of challenge that activists face on this front is, is the two party system and the ways in which that system um, makes it really hard for kind of challenges 
uh, you know, uh, on the kind of left or, 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 I mean, we'll talk about the right later, but um, uh, to, to emerge. Um, so, uh, so there's been, for instance, since the election, a real, uh, and during the election too, a really kind of intense conversation within the Democratic Party about how to relate to this movement, right? Um, and and an, an effort by many uh, to distance themselves uh, from, from some of the demands around the movement for Black lives. Uh, so that, that's kind of one kind of external challenge. Um, you know, I think um, a more internal challenge is how, do, how should kind of protest movements, which are by their nature extra institutional formations relate to institutional politics? Should they be involved in electoral politics? How should they be thinking about their relationship to parties, elections, legislatures, et cetera? And I think there's kind of a wide array of opinions about what, what the kind of theory of change is and what the relationship between extra institutional and institutional politics ought to be among movement activists and organizers. And I don't think that question is decided. And so it leads to kind of a fragmentation of efforts on various fronts. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to see a kind of, I guess, clearer kind of theory of change and a way of trying to think about how one translates what was really like uh, incredible energy in, in just an inspiring moment last summer into kind of uh, um, into institutional forms in ways that don't feel like you know you're being co-opted co by the institutions that already exist but that also enables you to kind of get your your agenda um, realized. So I saw in a dissent roundtable right after the election last November, um, you said uh, the movement of Black Lives has a platform that looks, links policing to wider questions of state violence and links abolition to economic re redistribution and transformation. These issues must be intimately connected to what kind of uh, economy and social order the left wants to build. So ha have you seen that happen over the over the course of the last few months with the Biden administration with, with some of the you know the infrastructure bill and some of the other things that they've been trying to do do you think they're they're connecting these these uh, issues together You know I think it it is it's a for uh, those of us who kind of witnessed the primaries that led to uh, Biden's nomination it's been really remarkable how much Biden has, has has kind of taken up certain central elements of redistribution. You know, we've seen like I think the child credit um, uh, that was passed earlier that isn't quite permanent, but you know has the potential to be permanent. Some of the some of the um, what's in the like larger infrastructure bill, which will address questions of ex, you know um, reducing the age of Medicare, uh, would. Um, Kind of imagines like the health, the care economy as a central part of our our social infrastructure. I think those are have been really um, uh, you know remarkable, and it's to the efforts. It's thanks to the efforts over the last um, um, let's say since to 2018 of el electing kind of progressives, uh, primarying moderate. Democrats and and building a really I think a more robust progressive caucus within the within Congress that has pushed um, Biden on these fronts. I mean I think at the same time um, there has been an effort to distance those kinds of redistributive agendas from the kind of abolitionist uh, frameworks developed by the movement for Black Lives. Uh, so uh, I alluded to this earlier, but for instance, um, you know, the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure bill included a, a, an amendment or, uh, or an attached resolution that, um, you know, disavows uh, uh, the defund the police. And Cory Booker, a Democratic senator, you know, got oops, on the floor of the Senate made very clear that this was a way for Democrats to signal that they in fact don't support defunding the police. I think another place which where this has been kind of visible is in the, you know, last year again in the summer, there were some really interesting conversations about reducing the American 
military budget, um, thinking about how resources might be. And these were fairly modest. Um, the Senate discussions were, were about 10% of the Pentagon's budget. And you know that, that has not been realized. In fact, I think the budget um, was slightly increased uh, for, for the Pentagon. So, and, and the kind of rhetoric around China and a kind of new Cold War framing, you know, only justifies further uh, investments in, in the kind of military um, and defense uh, uh, parts of the budget. So, so I think it's it's a mis mixed bag, honestly. Um, I think there's there's some really important, if the, especially if this uh, infrastructure bill gets passed, I think it will bring really meaningful uh, transformation to people's lives, but it, it isn't doing that work of kind of pairing redistributive a redistributive agenda with a kind of in a, in an abolitionist framework in the united states discussions about racial justice are directly connected to discussions about democracy and similar to many other nations around the world the united states is facing a serious threat to this political system professor gotacho's event last year took place before the january 6th insurrection but as you'll hear in this next clip she saw the warning signs after the clip we discussed the crisis in the united states more specifically and what we can learn from thinking about other nations that are also struggling with their democratic systems. So I grew up in on the African continent, uh, not too far from South Africa, actually in Botswana. And in the in the in the nineties, and you know, more generally, we think of dysfunctional democracy as a third world problem, right? Something that happens in Africa and in Latin America, these places where they just can't get democracy right. And of course. America is the exemplary case in that context. I mean, I think what the last, you know, at least four years, if not more, and this is not just about the US, but about mature democracies around the world is we've seen them come into crisis around the same kinds of things that, you know, uh, third world democracies have suffered from, namely kind of the politicization of identity, um, and forms of violence um, that are connected to political competition and mobilization. I mean, we're about to have an election in this country and, you know, it feels like war could break out in the context of an election. Uh, I don't mean to be alarmist, but it, that's the kind of sense in the air right now. Um, so I think one thing that I want to say and urge, especially the students on the call to think about is, you know, to reverse the question about democracy, to think about what is it that democracies like South Africa and democracy, democratic experiment, experiments and their failures around the world, how those experiences actually shed new kinds of light on the experiences we're having in the US and in, in Europe right now, right? Uh, to take those experiences of the third world, which are often treated as marginal, ex exceptional, and think that those are really the, the things that give us clues into how democracy operates and what some of its contradictions might be. So your event was before the January 6th insurrection. And I think in some ways you, you, your words were very prescient. So what does this growing anti-democracy movement in the United States mean for racial justice? What, what, what can students think about in, in terms of that? Yeah, it's a really, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, I think one thing that was really important and striking to me about the January sixth uprisings as or, or, or insurrection rather is is how um, the kind of social base of the people who were involved and participated in that. It's a kind of wide swath of people. Uh, all the way, you know, people who are in the kind of middle class, all the way to kind of working class people. And I think it's, you know, um, important to think about like what the kind of popular constituency of this sort of formation is, right? Um, I think it's very easy to kind of think about elite manipulation, right? To, to focus on the Republican Party or or kind of or Trump himself as these kind of instigators. Um, and it's not to disavow their kind of significance um, to, of course, in initiating and instigating this the um, an insurrection, but there is a real kind of social basis to these uh, to these formations. And I think um, 
um, thinking about what those are, what is it that people uh, secure materially, psych psychically, et cetera, from, from these kind of, uh, from the kind of, from everything from like meetings and uh, networks to social media kind of infrastructures, right? Uh, so to think about that, um, you know, I think, I, I guess I would say that I think um, the insurrection was really scary uh, for, and incredibly difficult to witness, to watch in that afternoon as we were all sitting at home. Um, but I think more a larger and more kind of difficult challenge on the question of racial justice is the institutional face of these kinds of anti-democratic projects. And by this, I specifically mean what we've witnessed since January 6, which is kind of state after state after state uh, passing anti, you know, uh, uh, voter rights restrictions. Um, uh, we've already seen we, in a, you know, in addition to this, we already have a kind of um, makeup or structure to the federal government that's counter majoritarian um, that you know weights states equally despite the vast differentials of populations at least in the Senate. So I think the kind of institute. I think it's also equally important to pay attention to the kind of institutional structures of anti democracy, some of which are like part of our federal structure from the very beginning and some of which are kind of new additions and, uh, and, 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 and emerge out of the backlash. And I think these are kind of equally, if not more of a threat to the project of racial justice as, these, as the kind of um, insurrection we saw on January 6th. How, how specifically are they, do they impact racial justice? Um, yeah, I, I know that there are many ways that they do. I'm not sure that that's gotten enough attention since January mm -hmm. 6th. So, so how how does does do these institutions do this? What you've seen happening since January 6th? How do they impact racial justice in the United States? Yeah, sure. I mean, the the most obvious, you know, and we can we will we'll have to see what the impact of these new um, voting rights restrictions will be on the ground, but. There is no question that we get um, um, you know, two Democratic senators in Georgia because of massive voter turnout, especially among African-American voters, but also voters of color across the board in metropolitan cities like Atlanta. Um, so you know, trying to undermine that, the possibility for that kind of turnout through these restrictions will mean that um, will may have consequences for who gets to represent uh, a state like Georgia or Texas. Um, I think that's one. Two, two you know, the uh, it, the Senate in the Senate, there's two senators per state, um, um, but increasingly, uh, you know, and this was oh, this has always been true, but it's becoming more and more so true that. The coastal states, um, again, which are more more diverse, are have larger populations um, than you know many of the kind of states in the middle of the country, and that was of course a kind a counter majoritarian design from the very beginning. But the the consequences of that over time is that the votes of of you know again um, you know mo more people of color. Um, Younger people, urban dwellers, et cetera, is it counts for less basically within that within that structure. So it means that you know, you, let's say you do get a lot of, a lot more people like Cory Bush elected, um, or you, you have them run for office, right? At the very least, the chances of getting them in office and the chance of that being able to translate that into a majority coalition within a legislature. Um, gets diminished. Um, so I think, um, so, and I think, th yeah, that, in, you know, a in a lot of, um, there are some policies that do seem to have majority backing when you poll Americans, um, not necessarily defund the police, but say universal health care or something like universal health care. Um, diverting some money from um, military spending to healthcare and education and housing. Those have majority support when you survey Americans, but how to challenge those, uh, um, which would have really important consequences for, for people of color in the United States, how to translate those into meaningful policy 
um, th these kind of institutions are roadblocks to that process. I'm not saying that if they were all gone that we would immediately be able to do that work of translating them into policy, but at the very least, these can tend to be kind of uh, sticking points or roadblocks to that process. So going back specifically to your answer from, from last year about this question, uh, you mentioned South Africa in your answer. I'm not sure if you meant South Africa or we're just saying South Africa to represent other nations, but nonetheless, there's a huge crisis in South Africa in July um, involving corruption, poverty, uh, lots of uprisings there as well. So, you know, I, I know it's not just South Africa that, that's going through a, a nation that's been going through a crisis in 2021. So what, what can students, what can people learn about the United States through thinking about something like the crisis in South Africa or maybe another country that, that you'd like to highlight that's that's been going through some difficulties in the past year? Yeah, you know, I think uh, my urging to think internationally and comparatively about democracy stems from two things. Like one, I, I think um, the United States and more generally the North Atlantic world has a tendency to be insular in its thinking that, you know, especially the United States has a sense of a kind of exceptionalism, the first democracy, you know, um, the most stable democracy, all of these things that generate a sense in which there's nothing to learn from the rest of the world. Um, so I think there's two lessons that something like a country like South Africa, but we could also talk about India, um, you know, these large multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, in the case of India, democracies demonstrate. I think one, so one is to think about like what actually makes us very similar to them. Um, um, so I think one kind of similarity that you can think across the board of these three, South Africa, India, and the United States, um, but also maybe uh, some of the other advanced democracies of the Western Europe, is the fact that um, you know these we have these long-standing party institutions whose coalitions no longer seem to hold, um, who are internally kind of incoherent coalitions, and I think partly what the kind of crisis we're experiencing is this recombination or or maybe initial just explosion and possible recombination of these constituencies and coalitions that made the ANC so dominant, you know, um, or that made labor in the UK a kind of uh, a social democratic party for so long, or, or the same with the Democratic and Republican parties in, in, our, in, our, in the United States. Um, so the South African uprisings in some way are, you know, as much as they are about the social crises of South Africa in this moment, they're also an intra-ANC intra battle that's being played out in this incredibly intense and horrific way. Um, so that's one kind of similarity, right? A second similarity might be, again, thinking with India and, um, and South Africa, when and why does racial identity become the site of democratic mobilization, right? Why is it that this moment um, enables kind of, let's say, in the United States, a really explicit form of um, of organizing around white racial resentment um, uh, or Hindu nationalism in India. What is it that enables this? What 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 makes them uh, mobilizable identities at certain moments and less so at other moments? And I think thinking comparatively allows us uh, to, um, you know, uh, just. Uh, think of ourselves less as the exception and maybe learn lessons from, uh, from these kind of comparative cases. But it's not to say that the, the fates of these democracies are in any way the same. I think the differences between ourselves and others is, is really important too. So one set of, you know, a set of differences is that many democracies around the world don't have the kind of counter majoritarian institutions that we have. They don't necessarily have Supreme Courts with such, such a significant veto power. Um, and so what does it mean, right, that we think of ourselves as the greatest democracy, but are constantly undermining what is a central pillar of, of democracy, which is majoritarian rule. One of the reasons that I wanted to reconnect with Professor Gattaccio is her focus on the linkages between the movement for Black lives and international racial and social justice movements. In this clip, and the ensuing discussion, 
we look at these global connections. One thing as someone who is really interested in internationalism is I think um, I wish the movement for Black Lives would more seriously think about the question of international solidarity. That is to say, I think that, you know, we've seen this outpouring of, of solidarity with uh, the movement for Black Lives. And I, I think there are moments um, where the movement has reached out to specific struggles and connected with specific struggles. But I would like to see a moment in which, you know, we kind of try to recover some of that uh, more reciprocal uh, forms of solidarity and internationalism that we did see in, um, in an earlier moment. You mentioned uh, last year that you'd like to see the movement for Black Lives think more seriously about international solidarity. So have you seen more of that in the past year? And what specifically would you like to see or what specifically have, have you seen in regards to that? Yeah, I think, um, um, you know, I've mentioned earlier the kind of Palestine solidarity that happened earlier this year. I think that's really, it's really important. Um, it's one, I think from, from the outside, it might seem um, surprising that that would be has been such an important link and it has been really since um um you know the F ferguson moment also involved these kind of gaza ferguson connections uh but but also um there you know there's a long-standing decades-long sort of solidarity uh between uh, palestinian activists and black activists so i think that's one kind of positive story to tell about um you know a kind of revived internationalism. I think another, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this last year when we talked, but um, the Vision for Black Lives platform from 2016, which was this kind of policy statement of the movement for Black Lives put out, put out initially in 2016, revised in 2020, um, does include a kind of, um, a, you know, a kind of foreign policy vision that involves kind of a dramatic de-escalation of, of US wars abroad, of, of, of defunding or, or radically scaling down a spending on, on, on defense, uh, a commitment to um, especially um, supporting a kind of uh, re and stability and security in, in areas where the US has been most engaged, primarily the Middle East and uh, the Horn of Africa region and Central America. Um, so, um, so I think there is this kind of like incipient language of internationalism uh, within the movement. Um, I think there, you know, I think there are challenges to realizing that, right? And I, and some of them are the same ones we talked about in the domestic context. So, uh, like what one kind of challenge is like what how do you build actually meaningful connections with movements in other places on the ground what are the institutions or the infrastructures that would enable that kind of international international solidarity so that you really understand people's specific struggles on the ground and know what it means to be in solidarity with them um, um, you know in earlier moments uh, there were like the Pan-African Congresses or these other kind of convenings that brought people together from a different different er areas of the world, et cetera. And that would be one way in which you forged some sort of connection. I think a second, um, and it's sort of related, is just about having um, uh, spaces of, for disseminating um, um, you know, kind of a crit a critical and internationalist perspectives. Um, uh, so that's just more, you know, in, in, I guess, news media, et cetera, newspapers, magazines, that kind of thing. And the third, I think, is building kind of, build, expanding um, internationalism within the United States. How would we kind of actually can persuade um, American citizens that internationalism is in their best interest. You know, I think there's one version of it that's very easy to persuade people about, which is like, look, if we cut the Pentagon budget, you could get healthcare and housing and all of those things. It's another step to be to say something like, okay, like if we're going to solve the climate catastrophe that's on the horizon, 
it's important for the United States not only to shore up uh, the United States, but also to help support and create a kind of global infrastructure that could really deal with climate change. Um, and I think, you know, the last year of seeing the, the response to the pandemic and the rollout of the uh, vaccine and the really deep inequalities, uh, global inequalities, are a sign just of how far we are from that image, vision, and, and of internationalism. One, one question that I've that I've had um, over the past year or so, and it's, it's come up just in, in different contexts. Um, you know, there are a lot of protest movements. You, you mentioned uh, uh, several just just now, but there's something like the the protest movement in Belarus. Um, that's, you know, Belarus is a very different society in the United States and a lot of other places in Europe. Uh, there's protest movement in Cuba, more focused on anti-authoritarianism. They're, they're not really a democracy, so they have, uh, they're not a democracy at all, so they have their own different issues to deal with. Um, are these protest movements that are just happening at the same time, do you see connections between something like Belarus and the movement for Black Lives, or is, is there anything that protesters in the United States can think about in terms of, of anti-authoritarian protests like that, or, or these just happen to be happening at the same time in different parts of the world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, yeah, it's hard to say. I think they're definitely very, you know, of course have very specific um, uh, contexts and reasons for, for starting. Um, um, but I think there's, um, you know, one thing that's really interesting, I think, uh, just observing some of these protests is how similar the some of the tactics are. So, for instance, um, in earlier moments of uh, Black Lives Matter protests, um, shutting down highways, right, was a really big a, a kind of central tactic of, of disrupting the way people move. Or, or kind of the die-ins that happened at, at malls and restaurants and these ways of disrupting commerce and, um, and the ability of tra for transportation. We've seen that in other protests around, around the world. I'm thinking for instance about the really large scale farmer strikes in India that similarly kind of made impossible you know, uh, movement around the city. Um, so I think there's something you know, I'll have to think more about it, and and this is just going to be tentative. But there, I think there's something similar about the way how these protests have decided to go about, like what what tactics they use, and perhaps they tell us something about what what are important sites of intervention in this particular moment, right? So mobility or or consumption tend to be really really central places if you want to make a kind of your voice heard or your impact felt. Um, and I think that probably says something just about generally where our societies are, are as a whole. Um, you know, I think, um, I do think there are, there are, there are lessons to be learned, uh, you know, both from failures of, 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 you know, mobilizations and, of successes, and you can see that in a in a variety of ways. So I mentioned and SARS, the and SARS protest in Nigeria earlier, but I think um, you could see how certain forms of organizing that are kind of prevalent now, decentralized, uh, also feminist led, which is uh, very distinctive. Um, that that is also has been true of, of the movement for Black Lives here also shaped that, that particular movement against uh, police violence. Um, so I think, you know, so I think also a shared challenge among some of these mo movements and mobilizations is how do you, um, you know, build beyond your core group of people, right? And it's, it's one thing if many people show up for the protest as they did last summer, but it's another, you know, when those people go home, what happens, right? How are they kind of engaged? How does that, how does that presence in the streets then translate into sort of either meaningful engagement or, or coalition building, et cetera. And I think that, that that challenge seems to repeat itself in some of these cases as well.
In this final clip from 2020, Professor Gattacho answers a question about how to stay hopeful. The question and answer specifically referred to the police officers who killed Brianna Taylor in Louisville last year, but were not indicted. As you'll hear, Professor Gattacho is still able to appreciate the progress that has been made in the past year and a half. I say this often, um, so if you've heard me say it before, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but, you know, I think, again, thinking back to my own, the work that I do and the period I studied in my book, um, Decolonization After World War II, uh, you know, if in 1945, if you would have said by 1960, over 20 African countries would have gained independence, no you would have been laughed out of any room, including the rooms where anti-colonial nationalists were struggling and deciding how to think about uh, the future of the world, right? It looked bleak, you know? And even the institutions we now associate with the kind of rise of decolonization, like the United Nations, were hostile to the project of self-determination. So, but in 15 years, by 1960, we're looking at a different kind of world order. It doesn't mean that that project of decolonization was like, oh, won and ended in 1960, right? But, it, you know, we were in a different stage or phase of the fight than, than, than we were in 1945. So in some ways that gives me hope because it's a reminder that po politics is not um, set in stone. It's not stuck in time. It's not a frozen uh, experience. It changes very rapidly, right? I mean, if, and if nothing else, I think the last four years should tell us um, things can, things can, our conditions, our context, our conjunctures could have been, would have been, or could be completely transformed in a matter of months. That's also a lesson of the 2020 protests. If when we went into lockdown in March 15 or whatever it was, if you had told people by the end of May, we will be living through the greatest resurgence of protest mobilization in the United States and in the world, people would have thought you were crazy, right? Um, so I think like remaining attentive to the real political contingencies uh, that structure our lives is, a re that's really important. And I think keeping your eye and, uh, you know, on uh, these s smaller experiments, right? It may be that, it may be that Breonna Taylor's killers won't be, um, you know, face trial, but this is also a summer in which many cities have voted to uh, withdraw some funds from the police. It's a moment in which students around at universities in K through 12 are insisting that they don't want police in their schools and on their campuses and are winning some of those fights. So to me, I look at this moment as one of not failure, but one of lots of promising possibilities. And it's not to say that they'll be realized, but there's, I think, much to feel optimistic about. We at Carney Council like to end our podcast on, on a hopeful note, and you uh, set that up for us very well, um, saying uh, last year that you were optimistic about, about a lot of different things. So I ask the question now about a year later, are you still optimistic? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, well, it's been a very difficult year, uh, you know, a, a second year of this pandemic, um, I think a whole set of dislocations all around the world. Um, and yeah, there's much to be very pessimistic about, I think, um, including the, you know, the climate crisis that's on, on our, on our doorsteps. But I think, um, you know, I think I said some version of this last year too. I do think politics is the arena of the unexpected, and and there's always things that come up that are that are surprising. Um, uh, you know, I think for for instance, um, uh, af months after I think, or maybe the same month we spoke last time. Um, in Bolivia, the the kind of unexpected, a huge uh, victory for um, um, the MAS um, was, I think, really, really encouraging. Uh, I think, as I said, I, I remain, you know, really surprised and uh, cautiously optimistic about some of the directions the Biden administration has gone, especially on 
the domestic parts of, of kind of thinking about redistribution, um, thinking about the care economy, reimagining what infrastructure looks like. Um, I think and hope it sets it sets us up for um, you know larger scale investments down the line. Um, uh, I think you know um, I remain very inspired by people who risk their lives all over the world to fight for the things they believe in. And you mentioned Cuba and Belarus, um, um, uh, Nigeria and Palestine, and all these places. I think. Uh, people really have a vision of a better world and they're willing to risk life and limb uh, to make it possible. So I think in that context, even though there's the challenges I think we face are really unprecedented, they're going to take us, there isn't an easy answer or an easy fix um, to many of the questions before us, but um, it seems to me that, you know, as long as people are willing to fight for what they believe in, that the possibility of a better world is always on the horizon. Professor Adam Gattaccio, thank you so much. Great, thank you. That was Professor Adam Gattaccio, New Bauer Family Assistant Professor of Political Science in the College at the University of Chicago. She's the author of World Making After Empire. For more on the Protests and Perspective series, and for a complete transcript of this talk, you can go to carnegiecouncil.org. Thanks for listening to Global Ethics Review, and stay safe and healthy.